Hello and welcome to EOCIL's third annual virtual pride celebration. I am Mary Ellen Buxton. I use they them pronouns. Um, I'm the assistant director of our 2S LGBTQIA plus services at EOCIL. Um, I identify as non-binary and queer um, and I have the pleasure of being able to moderate this session for our intergenerational panel. Um, EOCIL will be facilitating online 2S LGBTQIA plus awareness sessions throughout June. In addition, we have partnered with many local 2S LGBTQIA plus community organizations to organize in-person pride celebrations in Ontario, La Grande, Pendleton, and the Columbia Gorge region. The goal of EOCIL's second oh, third annual virtual and in-person pride celebration is to promote awareness, inclusion, greater acceptance, and support for all members of our 2S LGBTQIA plus communities. When EOCIL began in 1997, we witnessed firsthand how our 2S LGBTQIA plus community members with and without disabilities faced stigma, exclusion, and disparities. We committed to reshaping our Eastern Oregon community so that our 2S LGBTQIA plus community members did not have to move from Eastern Oregon to metropolitan areas to experience inclusion, acceptance, and support. It has not been easy, and even though we have seen more communities and agencies become inclusive, we still lost too many 2S LGBTQIA plus community members to suicide, incarceration, and overdose. Remember to practice self-care and be aware of risks and discomforts. Complex and prolonged trauma can profoundly affect physical, mental, and behavioral health outcomes. Talking about stress, emotions, and experiences of adverse and traumatic events may be distressing. Your experiences are very personal and discussing them may upset you. You decide what you want and can share. You can pause during the discussion, request a break, or you may end your sharing time if you choose. EOCIL will have a trauma-informed behavior health specialist available during each session. Um, if you need to talk with EOCIL's behavioral health specialist during or after the session, you can reach out to me to reach out to Carrie. Um, EOCIL would like to thank you all in advance for sharing your personal experiences and stories. We know it will make our communities, schools, and other settings more inclusive, safer, and better places for all. Um, now I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, uh, we have Toby and Ashton and Ray, and I'm going to just call on you guys to kind of introduce yourselves, if that's okay. Uh, Ray, would you like to start? Sure. Hi, I'm Ray. Uh, he, him pronouns. Um, I am 35. Uh, living in Portland, Oregon. Um, sorry, Mary Ellen. What else you want me to ask or talk about? Um, how about your pronouns? Um, your identities. Um, what you do personally, professionally, recreationally, etc. Yeah. Um, so trans guy. Um, still working on all the other details, but queer whatever <laughs> um professionally i'm an electrician um been doing that for about six years now um prior to that i was in the military um so that definitely is why i didn't come out till later in life um yeah uh recreationally i like hanging out with my dog or reading with my cat um do a lot of hiking and weightlifting Um, Toby, are you ready to share? Hi, um, my name is Toby. I use uh, he, it pronouns with a handful of neo pronouns. Um, I identify as um, genderqueer or just generally trans, um, uh, just queer, gay, um, yeah. Uh, recreationally, I I uh, play a lot of D and D, um, and I watch a lot of horror movies. Beautiful. Um, Ashton, are you ready to share? Hell yeah, I'm ready to share. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ashton, um, I use he uh, pronouns, but I didn't feel like including those, so I didn't. Um. Currently 17. I'm pursuing a career in IT. Just nothing too specific, just general computering and junk. Um, 
I also play a lot of D&D. I have a ton of shows I've collected that I'm incredibly interested in. I heart anime. Uh, when forced to think about my identity, I've suddenly forgotten everything about myself. But at the very least, I'm a trans dude. Probably gay. Beautiful. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I'm so happy to have you all here. Um, I'm just going to jump into the questions and uh, you can answer whatever you want to answer, um, whatever speaks to you, and you don't have to answer everything. So I want to start with personal journeys. Um, if comfortable, uh, can each panelist share their coming out story and how it was received by their community and family at the time? I'll let y'all just unmute at your own discretion. Um, so I've come out like a million times. Um, I didn't realize it would be like a lifelong process of coming out all the time. <laughs> um, first time I came out, I was like 15. And then I told my parents that I was bi. Um, my dad was just very excited. He was hoping I would only date women and that I could never get pregnant and he'd never have to deal with that. Uh, <laughs> my mom was like, oh my God, you'll get beat up in the locker room. And I was like, mom, it's 2004. It's not the 80s. It's, it's fine. Um, and that's kind of been the theme, you know, I've, as my identity has grown and changed, and I've, you know, had awareness of myself. Um, I've had to come back to the table with my parents a number of times. Um, and my dad has always just been like, I love you. I support you. Um, uh, my mom is trying her best. <laughs> um, but I've just, I think I've made a point to only keep people in my life who, have kindness in their heart. I don't bother with people who want to bring me down. So I have intentionally, you know, crafted a positive experience for myself. I don't have patience for people who have a problem with me because I exist. So. Toby or Ashton? I can go first. It's chill. A uh, coming out story. I, funnily enough, also started with coming out as bi, but it was middle school, and no one cares about middle school sexualities really because you're like twelve. What do you know? So, I first came out to my dad, sitting on the couch while he was playing the game, and I don't. He didn't really take it good or bad. He kind of just told me to focus on school which at the time upset me, but now there was pretty good advice not to worry about really relationships or anything. So I focused on school. Um, and then I think one of my friends came out as trans. And before that, I didn't know what that meant. I'd heard the word around, and of course I've heard a handful of slurs, but I didn't know what any of it meant. Like, my parents didn't really talk to me about gay people or anything, because they're not gay. What do they know about gay people? So that was kind of a shock. And looking into it more, I was like, hey, that sounds fun. Like, I don't really feel like a girl in any sense of the word and being neurodivergent and everything. Way furthered that. Just alienation. So I experimented with that for a bit came out as a boy and that was taken pretty well it took them a little bit to get used to pronouns but they supported me and now I'm here uh for for me it was um pretty similar I also came out as bi at first when I was maybe 11 or 12 and uh my parents didn't take it well but they didn't really take it all that badly my mom just kind of told me I was too young for that uh 
and then a few years later it was like 13 I um came out as trans and they took it fine sort of um my parents are still struggling a bit to get used to it um but they're they're trying I'm pretty sure they're trying and with the people around me I mean I've when I was younger, I basically just surrounded myself with other pretty cool queer people. So um, that wasn't much of an issue either. All of my friends took it well. And well, school was, well, high schoolers, uh, middle schoolers are mean. So that went as, about as well as uh, it would for, it does for most queer people. <laughs> um, For all of the panelists. How has your understanding of your own identity evolved over time? And you kind of talked about it a little bit, but you can get back into it. Um, I grew up like in a conservative state and then joined the military when I did leave that state. So like, I didn't actually have awareness of like words for myself. Like, um, I think when you say the word transgender, most people just think of trans women. Um, as they just are more visible in our society in a way. Um, so it wasn't until I moved here in like 2017 that I was like, oh, there's a word for how I feel. <laughs> um, and I started with coming out non-binary and, um, you know, it was just, things changed for me and I was able to delve more into my own identity. I uh, eventually got brave enough to pull the trigger on starting tea. And um, that's really like been its own slip and slide into way more, way more trans. <laughs> um, I, 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 my feelings have changed a lot since I started hormones and for the positive. So um, that's not to say it's all been great. There's a lot of things you have to figure out that I think we don't talk about enough. Like um, there's also a sense of grief with, you know, like my changing identity, like I didn't want to be the person I was for 30 years, but that was the person I was. And so as my appearance changes, my voice is changing, um, you know, having to say goodbye to the person I was, even if that wasn't my ideal person is its own process too. I to remember the question. Um, <laughs> I kind of, I had a weird experience with figuring out my identity that I think is really common, where I kind of just tested everything out. I just did everything. You know, I was just like non-binary, gender fluid. I tried different expressions. Um, but it always seemed like it just kept going back to just being a boy and so that's what I've stuck with because I know that it's always gonna be pretty much true but usually went through you know the pipeline that every trans person goes through like trans guy specific where it's just like she to she they to they to he to him like to he they to he him the typical experience that was definitely a big part of it and then I discovered neo pronouns and like xeno genders and everything and that's still a process that I'm working through very fun though there's so much to it uh for for me um growing up trying to like figure out who I was it uh it, it definitely wasn't easy I uh I was raised very not necessarily conservatively but I was raised very religious and some of my older family members and more distant family members are incredibly conservative. So that was um that was that was pretty difficult to try and like figure out, work around, and felt like very guilty about it for like a pretty long time until um fifth grade. Uh a friend a friend of mine had like come out as bi and that made me think like oh maybe 
that's me too and then from there it just switched so much I went from bi to uh lesbian until I found out that like I might be trans and then I thought I was non-binary lesbian then to uh just generally queer probably just gay trans guy <laughs> Um, a question for our younger folks on the panel. Do you want to talk a little bit about just neo pronouns and like what, like what ones maybe you use and or what ones you've used in the past and like what they really mean and what they really mean to you and how they help serve you? Um, for me personally, a lot of the reason I use neo pronouns, which is basically just any pronoun aside from like the typical ones like he, she, and they, I think it would be considered a neo pronoun because it's not a pronoun uh, humans typically use or people would typically use. Um, but a lot of the reason I use them is a sort of... It is different than the reason I use he or anything like that. It's more of like sort of aesthetic showcase of like who I am and who I feel like or like what sort of person I feel like. Um, and I or like maybe any sort of animals or creatures that I might relate heavily to or just things like that, like um, About it, I think. Yeah, I have a similar experience with neo pronouns in a way, though I feel like the main reason I use them is that autistic sense of like not dehumanization, but just the feeling of not quite being the same as other people. Like you don't feel quite human in a way. And you know, sometimes I just I want to feel like an object. Just like a, I don't know, I feel like an ex today. Don't know what that means, but that's what I feel like. And also, they're just fun. Like, are you kidding me? I can use, like, corpse pronouns? That's sick as hell. Thank you both so much for sharing. Um, um, I'm going to move on to historical context a little bit. Um, this question is more for Ray, but Toby and Ashton are absolutely willing to share as, or are absolutely, you can share as well. Um, but Ray, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced as an LGBTQ plus person growing up? Um, I kind of alluded to it a little bit ago. I think it was just, um, lack of awareness um so I mostly was you know growing up late 90s early 2000s as a kid that was my my range um and so a lot of the really like brutal cruelty was passe you know there wasn't a lot of like locker room beatings for being gay kind of stuff I mean it happened but um it was just more there's a lot of ignorance and not understanding and it was not just people who were outside the community it was people within the community too um so you know i didn't even know the term non-binary existed i had no idea it's like you were at one or the other there, there was only the binary <laughs> um and there was only like one trans man that anybody had ever heard of and he was on the cover of i want to say like times magazine um because he was having a baby and so people could see this man with a baby um like pregnant belly um and it was just like such a sideshow at the time um i don't think that he was treated with the right respect that he should have been for the experience he was having um so yeah it was just i i didn't even know like even though i was aware that person existed like i didn't connect that my tomboyness was actually transness um 
so there was no pipeline for me to follow as a young person um yeah Do either Toby or Ashton want to talk about um, challenges growing up? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about something. Um, with it is definitely different from like older generations, the way that queer people are treated. Um, but specifically now, with all of you know the digital era, we've got so much just technology and definitely a lot of social media and especially with like this like gen alpha that's been raised on technology for like the majority of their lives and like growing up with technology and being on the internet at a really young age which isn't good it's kind of warped a lot of people's perception of a lot of things and definitely not in a good way Queer people in general have gotten a lot more visibility in a way, I suppose, in the sense that a lot more people know about the general, you know, basic LGBT. Mostly everyone knows what that means. You know, the, you know the basics of like, this is what a trans person is. You know, this is what a bi person is. But they've it's gotten a little convoluted to where... Like, there are fights in between the, like, in the community, between different groups, like, trying to exclude just trans people or, like, just gay people or just really messing with what it means to be queer. And that in itself is kind of extended to straight people in a way where you're allowed to try things and you're allowed to have, like, not necessarily phases because that does have like a negative connotation in terms of queer youth and just being queer in general and going through oh it's just a phase but in general yeah phases um where a lot of people will try out being gay but are just really rude about it or like there's a word i'm thinking of they think they know everything about being queer more than the like queer people you know it's it's difficult being in a high school setting with other queer youth that don't are on the internet way too much Toby did you want to share for this one uh, yeah, sure. I think I have a few things that um, might be worth mentioning. I feel like with, um, especially now, like, like Ashton said, in a very technology-based era, growing up and being queer is very different from how it was even in, like, the 2010s or the 2000s. Um, something I've seen a lot is in a lot of like online spaces is not necessarily queerness being treated as a joke but it is only jokes like even straight people will constantly make jokes about being queer and being gay when they aren't and i feel like that can really affect like how um an actual queer person might like grow up or like view queerness if like there's a bunch of straight people, um, specifically in high school, there's a bunch of straight people saying they are queer as a joke or acting queer or gay as a joke. I feel like that can really affect um, a queer person, a young queer person's uh, perception on the community and everything. And um, uh there was something else I was trying to say, but I, I forgot. So that's it. Thank you. I really appreciate you all sharing um, just a little more context of you growing up. Um, yeah, this one's a question for everybody. Um, 
Um, how do you perceive the progress made by the LGBTQ plus community over the years? I, uh, I think a lot has been done, especially in the last few years, to be more inclusive for trans identities. Um, I had to do my homework <laughs> and watch some, you know, shows that like depict, you know, prior generations. But um, it seems that the community has come a long way, and it's by no means perfect. Um, but um, yeah, like that's like the Eagle. Uh, if you're not familiar, is like the you know gay man bar in uh Port North Portland. Um, they even have a statement on their website that they're very tired of the divisions within the queer community. And so they're intentionally inclusive on their website. Uh, I haven't been there in person, so I can't confirm whether that's the experience in real time. Um, but I am seeing more of that of just like intentional acceptance, acceptance of trans identities that was lacking before. Um, you know, still got a ways to go, but it's happening. Um, I feel I, in terms of like how, um, how much progress the queer, the queer LGBTQ community has made, like, over the course of <laughs> forever, it's within these past few, like within this past decade, there's been like an absurd amount of progress that has been made, like, um, gay marriage getting legalized at, getting legalized after like hundreds of years of it being illegal to even be gay or display that you are gay um which actually wasn't too long ago um but i do think that recently i want i kind of want to say within the past four or five years um not necessarily within the queer community but in general with laws and everything um the progress that has been made has slowly been being reduced or it's slowly reverting. There's a lot of people trying to revert the progress we've made to how it used to be like in the 1900s. Um, yeah. I think they uh, pretty much covered it, so I'll pass on this one. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I'm going to pivot on to generational differences. Um, this is open to everybody. Are there any stereotypes or misconceptions you think exist between different generations within the LGBTQ plus community? Um, there's a few. Um... The older generations can sometimes be, or it seems this way, anyway, um, more conservative. Um, so sometimes talking to them can feel like almost as bad as trying to talk to straights <laughs> of the same age. Um, they're usually a little bit more patient, but, and again, that is a generalization. We're talking about stereotypes. I'm not trying to bash our old, our elders here. Um, but yeah, there's definitely I have to, I definitely have to explain myself more to elder folks than I do young kids. If I meet a, somebody Ashton's age, um, he's just like, hey, I'm a trans guy. And they're like, I got you. And I have to like talk about it. They get it. <laughs> I am, um, I agree completely. Um, another thing that I've noticed between the different generations is um again not at all trying to bash just talking about like uh stereotypes and misconceptions that I think might be present between different generations is um a lot of the times uh queer people from older generations think that younger people might 
not necessarily be as queer, but uh, I've noticed a lot of older queer people talking about younger queer people and saying things that they're not as like serious, um, specifically about things like xenogenders or neo pronouns or the whole like non-binary gender fluid, anything aside from trans girl and trans boy is um, sometimes I think is seen as a waste of resources for real trans people, quote unquote. And um, yeah, agree completely on the like sometimes older queer people can be a bit more closed minded and I think that um a lot of younger queer people take that and apply that to all older queer people. Um along with things like stereotypes just within the community, like I've seen a lot of gay people that wholeheartedly believe that all bi people are cheaters or things like that. There's a lot of harmful stereotypes and misconceptions within the community in between generations. I have a little bit to add on, um, not too much, but specifically with just the difference between the two um, concerning labels, kind of like what Toby said with, you know, if it's not trans or just generally gay or bi, then it's not as valid of a queer identity as theirs, um, especially because, you know, the younger generation of queer identities more and came, came up with tons of labels. And as someone who kind of uses labels and kind of doesn't, um, I feel like it is completely valid to either not use labels at all and just kind of do what you do. And also, feeling like you need a label for everything. It's nice to feel like you have a community or a space or something to connect yourself to. And also just, did you have something? Well, if you thought, Ash, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. We're good. With the uh, older generations, a lot of older generations of queer people went through a lot more struggling than younger generations do and I feel like sometimes that gives them a sense of like you're not as valid as I am because you didn't go through all of the trouble I had to go to in a sense um, the last thing you said Ashley is actually what I was gonna mention um, there is a lot of trauma for our older generations. Um, so that is something I try to keep in mind when I'm talking to them is they have, they actually have the experience of having to fight for their rights. And, you know, nowadays we're getting to just kind of coast along on their coattails. And yes, there is a lot of stuff that like politically is not good right now with uh, queer rights, but um, we are still enjoying the privilege that they brought for us. Um, so yeah, I think for them, it's, you know, like it wasn't until I want to say 2008 that the WPATH guidelines came out for trans identity. Um, and prior to that, you had to have like severe dysphoria specifically about your genitalia um, before a doctor would even consider treating you for trans identity. Um, so there was an actual benchmark to be trans enough, like non-binary was not a medical thing that you could get HRT for. Um, so it's like, you know, we can't, we owe them a thanks, but you know, maybe some softness, like it's okay, come to the come to the side. It's all right. You can you can be with us. <laughs> um another question for everybody. Um how can different generations within the LGBTQ plus community support each other better? I think just listening to each other. Um, I see a lot of people like on the TikTok and the Instagram. Um, you know, they take like misinformation and actually make an effort to refute it. And not only do they have their personal opinions, but I love when they actually like 
pull out like research and you know state real facts and i don't know how much visibility these you know arguments actually get but i just love seeing that people are out there like no that guy's rude <laughs> he's wrong and this is why um so yeah i think as much as a curse as social media can be it's also a huge you know platform to get more information out there Something I see a lot personally that I think um, is very helpful for like connecting the older and younger generations. And I see it, I've seen it like at um, pride festivals and, and online, like in comments on posts is really just talking to each other, like talking, trying to explain possible stereotypes or misconceptions. Like, um, the younger generation trying to just instead of like label oh you don't get it boom you're a bigot explaining like no it is still trans we're not like wasting resources and like here's why as well as the older generation explaining like what the struggle they went through was really like or what it was really like to be queer in like the 70s or the 60s or even the 80s like how hard it was, like how hard you had to fight. I think just really trying to talk and explain each other's point of view instead of just um you don't get you don't agree with me, you are not a good person. Um I think just talking and explaining really helps. Yeah, those are definitely both really good you know, coverage of the issue. Uh, the only thing I have to add on is just being empathetic in general. So I think a lot of people's issue is that they, yeah, don't feel enough empathy or compassion for other generations and what they went through. But that's all different. Um, I have just a few more questions left. Um, Um, a big part of the queer community is the concept of chosen family. Um, and, and gender and sexuality can play obviously a very big role in just relationship building, um, and what relationships will look like individually. Um, so my question is, um, how have your views on relationships and family evolved over time? Uh, for me, I was raised with a very traditional sense of family. Your blood family is your family. You cannot do anything to change that. And you have to forgive and for what they may think or say to you. And I think over the years, that's that's really changed for me. Um, I most of my family, I really do not see as my family anymore. But it's more so the people I have around me, like the the people that come to the EOC CIL Youth Center, and just a lot of my friends are, um, I consider them more to be like family than my actual family now. I um, grew up in a household where like my older sibling was wild, borderline feral. He was very feral. Uh, <laughs> He took a lot of attention um, because he just was constantly causing issues. Um, so I was kind of like, I wasn't, you know, neglected or ignored, but in a way I was too. Um, so I found a lot more comfort with friends at school, teachers, whatever. Um, so that's something that I feel I was really lucky. I already had this idea that family is people you find. 
um, before I really registered what that was. Um, and then I've had a lifestyle where I've moved so much. Um, you just kind of have to find a way to anchor yourself to people who matter. And they can't always be family or people you've known for a long time. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just been kind of a thing I've always had to do to survive. Um, so that's been a real blessing as I come into my own queer identity. Um, cause I've kind of already set up to do that. Christian, do you have any, anything for this one? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's been around the same experience. That's super okay. Um, 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 um. Um, who, who do you see as important role models in the LGBTQ plus community today? I actually think it's a lot of younger people. Um, I see a lot of, you know, people on social media who have a platform and they use it to, you know, share their queer identity with the world. Um, and I really think those people are like the real heroes because um, it takes a lot to just be more or less a normal person. You know, you don't have celebrity status where you have an entourage of people protecting you and taking care of your security. Um, so just putting your identity out there on the internet openly, um, that's huge. And so I just, I really admire those people who can do that. Uh, Ray covered that really amazingly, and I uh, feel the exact same way, so I don't really have anything to add to that. Uh, I'll add something. Um, it's not necessarily just the older generation, but they kind of paved the way for it. Uh, but drag queens, I really look up to. So I feel like, in general, you have to have a lot of not talent but a lot of hard work goes into being able to call it a talent just the performance and the makeup and the expression of a lot of drag queens is awesome i love it it's so fun and just in general being able to do something that you love like that and face a ton of criticism and still do it is admirable Um, trans women and drag queens, when there is overlap there especially, um, have done a lot for our community um, historically to get us to where we are. Um, I mean, they would stage sit-ins at gay bars, like wanting acceptance. Um, within the queer community, I don't know if there's any group that you can say fought harder for our inclusion than trans women and drag So they're pretty, pretty epic. Absolutely incredible points y'all made. Um, I have a final question, and then we have a little bit of time left for Q and A. If y'all are comfortable with that, um, but my final question is: What hopes and dreams you have for the future of the LGBTQ plus community? I'm just hoping that we can ride off into the rainbow covered sunset on the backs of unicorns together. I feel like that would be a good goal to get to eventually. Um, but in the meantime, I think it would be really nice and a huge thing I'd like to see accomplished is um, more just more people not spreading misinformation about polyamory and also polyamorous marriage being legalized it's just god i wish because <laughs> that is something in the queer community that's still not seen as too good you know there's still a lot of misinformation about it and definitely a lot with straight people and just general non-queer
uh, one of my biggest hopes for the future, hopefully the very near future, is um, to be able to successfully fight against all of these harmful bills and like all of these um, very harmful um, laws that uh, a lot a lot of people are trying to really hardly really hard to get past. I really hope we are successfully able to fight against those. So really everyone, so that really everyone in the queer community can just live their life without having to worry about the people that want them to go extinct or um, completely, the people that are trying to make queer people disappear. I hope we're able to get past all of that. And I know that's going to take like a lot of work and a lot of fight going to be really 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 hard but I really do think it will happen there is a lot of similarities and parallels um right now what's going on with trans rights to um when gay marriage was initially like on the table as a hot button issue um I think you see a lot of the same exact things they said about gay marriage ruining society whatever as they're saying about trans kids now and you know I don't we are definitely in a much more tumultuous time, I think. I think, you know, we it's important that if you have the ability to get out there, vote, you know, speak up, say your thing, um, don't let them get away with it. But I think this is just kind of the the shit storm before um, you know, as long as we keep fighting our battles, I think we'll get there. Um, we just have to go through all the the loud backlash until you know they just finally come down and say hey you know i have one more thing that i would like you know after all of this um especially after you know fighting all of these stupid people squashing them like bugs i would like to have gender affirming care in general therapy, surgeries, HRT, anything, let's make it free. Or at least affordable, please. That would be lovely. I super duper appreciate all of your answers. Um, beautiful dreams, beautiful hopes, awesome fingers. Um, 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 um. Oh, I'm going to open it up to Q&A if anybody has any questions for anyone on the panel. Um, now would be your time. And I'll give y'all a second to ponder. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys for sharing. First of all, it was great listening to you guys. Um, something I really enjoyed hearing was about the neo pronouns because that's something I've really been ignorant on. Like I really didn't know much about them. So it was great learning about that. So my question is, uh, what is one thing you find people are most ignorant about or something that bothers you that you wish people were more educated about? Um, like Ashton said, uh, polyamory is something I really, really wish more people were educated about and knew more about, because a lot of people uh, confuse it with polygamy, which is very, very different. And um, with neo pronouns and stuff and xeno genders, I kind of just wish people took it more seriously and knew more about it or took the time to do research about it. I found this document online, um, thanks to Reddit. Uh, God bless Reddit. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Gender Dysphoria Bible. I wish that we could just make everyone read it. Um, that gender dysphoria is just so much more complicated than, you know, like, oh, they just feel like a girl or a boy today. Like, it's not a casual passing feeling. And 
you know, the people who are in it obviously understand it. But even then, like, um, after reading that, like, understanding, like, the levels of how much gender dysphoria affects your day-to-day -day, um, and even just your thought processes um, without even it necessarily being a conscious gender issue. Um, I just wish people really understood how much more complicated the issue is for trans people to live, you know, their identity. Uh, I'd like to add on to that once I remember what I was going to say. Right. Um, <laughs> something that's a huge pet peeve of mine when people interact with the queer community is that so many people do not understand the difference between gender, gender expression, and pronouns. Because all of those are separate things that do not have to relate to each other. You could be like someone who is completely cis, identifies as a woman, dresses like a boy, and uses they them. And that's all completely valid. You can be a boy, boy that looks like a girl and uses it. Like it's all a thing and no one knows what it is. Thank you guys so much for answering. Those were great answers. And I think I could learn some things more about all of those as well, but. Yeah, I completely agree. I see a lot of ignorance on those topics without, throughout the community. Ryan, would you like to go ahead? Um, yeah, so um, I really just kind of wanted to say thank you um, for like your responses. Um, I'm over 40 and I just feel like, um, like I got lost, I guess, um, in like the queer um, LGBTQA like movements, because I felt because I felt old and um, like I didn't know, and it was easier to just like step away and step out um, than to like like some someone said like it was kind of it's more work to to talk to older generations, and I feel like it is more work to talk to me, and so. Like I didn't know about the Zoom call till yesterday and I'm trying to like get back into the mix. And so one of the things I want to do is read more literature and be like more knowledgeable. I just like there's a part of me that doesn't even know where to start. Um, and so um, just listening to you and like book recommendations, if there is a book recommendation that you feel um, would be good for older generations, like you said. Um, is really helpful, especially um, I'm trying to pull all my older friends with me, um, and it's difficult because because we're tired, I guess, and we're scared because we feel like we should know, but we don't know, and um, it's hard to keep up. So, um, but it is great that you're moving, that you're still going. I do feel that, and um, we're also scared about the culture, culture that could be. Um, because there could be a negative culture and we've seen it. So um, so yeah, so I just want to say thank you for sharing it because I do feel that. And um, and if there are book recommendations or movies, literature, those kinds of things um, that we could do to support um, and to be more knowledgeable is great, I guess, so. Ryan, you cannot leave me. Please bring all your friends. I am far too young to be the old person here, okay? Um, but I, I mentioned the Gender Dysphoria Bible. That is, it's not particularly long. It's an online document um, that is just really informative and very in-depth. Um, I highly recommend Gender Dysphoria Bible. Obi, you got any any literature to share? Yeah, um, I I do actually. There's this um movie that came out really recently, like I think a few days ago, but it's called um I saw the TV glow, and it is a horror movie, but it has um a huge trans allegory, and I personally haven't seen it yet, 
but from what I've seen, it has left a lot of trans people and just queer people in general who have seen it in shambles <laughs> in the best way possible. It seems like it, it was a very impactful movie. It had some really great messages and tackled the whole subject really amazing. Thank you both for your answers. Um, also, we we lost Ashton. His phone died, um, but that's that's okay. Uh, and we'll just have one final question. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. we'll have one final. Oh, does does Ashton have any any literature to share? Uh, I asked him. He said he doesn't. <laughs> okay, that's super okay. So we'll just have one final question from Kelly and then we'll wrap up. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Toby, Ray, Ashton, thank you so much for one, being brave and being here and sharing your stories and um, your thoughts. I, I truly appreciate it. And Ray and Ryan, you guys aren't the oldest one here. I'm pretty sure I think it's me. <laughs> so, um, and mine's more of a comment. Um, it, it's, it's sad to hear that me as an older generation and then you as a younger generation feel that we have this divide and and i see it i experience it i'm part of the problem um so ryan i appreciate you stepping in and talking about you know some of us older folks having that fear of we don't know or it was so different when when i was growing up there wasn't all of the she her him they there you know there there was no pronouns used it was gay, bi, transgender, that's all there really was. So <clears throat> I think um, as an older generation, openly gay male, I, for me, and I've, I've learned a lot just from hearing conversations and being a part of conversations with like Mary Ellen and Ashley, um, keeping me in the know. And as an older person, I, I want to be cool. I want to be in the know. I want to speak freely and speak correctly and be accepting of all. It's just that I don't always know. And sometimes I do misspeak. Um, so I do appreciate as an older person, um, when the younger folks are coming and, and giving their stories and sharing their examples of what's accepted now and what this means or what this stands for, please remember just to be patient, especially <laughs> when you're dealing with old people from small communities who don't really get a chance to experience a lot of that. Um, so I just, again, thank you to the three of you for sharing. Um, I know it's not always easy and I, I'm all about, I mean, the future lies with you guys, you know, like you guys all mentioned, there were people way before me that kind of led a path. And then there was people in my age group that continued on. And now you guys are coming in and, um, you know, cleaning up messes and then also building new fantastic things to, for the next group to go through. So my only thing is let's, be patient with us and and remember that it's not so much us wanting to be stupid or ignorant. It's just we don't know. And it takes time for us older folks to um, wrap our head around things, especially when it's moving so quickly. Um, and and there's a lot to learn. So that's all I have to say. And again, thank you. Thank you to you three. I appreciate you. Hey, Kelly. OK, well, with that, I just want to say Thank you to all of our listeners. Thank you to our panelists. Um, we have a lot more in store for our Pride series. Our next installment will be on June 12th at 11 a.m. Pacific time, noon mountain time. And that will be followed by our chosen family presentation at 3 p.m. Pacific time and 4 p.m. mountain time also on June 12th. And then there's a whole bunch after that, but just wanted to plug the next ones. So I really hope to see everybody there. I'm really excited for them. And thank you again so much for sharing your stories. It really means the world to me and to EOCIL and I'm sure to those listening. But with that, thank you. Bye-bye.